This episode is brought to you by America's Rehab Campus. Get on the road to recovery with the best rehab in beautiful Arizona. Dial 1-833-272-7342. That's 1-833-ARC-REHAB. Good morning, world, ladies and gentlemen, everyone out there. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the RCast. My name is Buddha, and I'm in the studio today with another homie, man. I mean, it's, it's such a blessing. The people that we get in here, the stories that we get in here. This gentleman that I got right now, he's a clinical specialist, a certified life coach, and he is the author of the book, The Book of Joel. We're going to have all those links and everything in the description so you guys can go show him love. Get up out your seat. Give a huge round of applause to my brother and homeboy, Joel Carroll. What up, dog? What's going on, brother? How you doing? I'm blessed. Yeah? Yes, sir. Good to see you, bro. Looking looking spiffy, you're all ready to go, dog. You look like you're ready for book signing and everything. Anytime I walk out the door. <laughs> That's what's up. How you been? What's been what's been new? Blessed. Just working, taking care of uh my responsibilities. Okay. You know, working full time at uh, another treatment facility and and doing everything I can to aid and assist the individuals that come through those doors. You know, it's it's dude, it's it's awesome to see you, bro. It's been a few years. Uh, you know, the the growth that I've seen over the years. I remember when you were first writing this book. Sir. I remember when you had the cliff notes and, you know, we would go back and forth and kind of throw ideas back and forth. And I'm looking at this book right now, guys. It's, it's incredible. Why don't you uh, discuss the cover real quick? What is this, Massey? Some demons on here. The Book of Joel. Cunning, baffling, and powerful. What, what gave you the influence to want to write this book, brother? Me surviving everything that I went through in life and having the ability mentally to sit down and actually live in the moment to share a story, not only for uh, individuals that are struggling with addiction, mental illness, but also their family members who do not understand and are praying and trying their best to understand why their loved one continuously goes down that rabbit hole yeah. when they have so much potential to live. And not only those individuals that I wrote it for, uh, for my daughter in Virginia, uh, Sienna, because I wasn't in her life because I chose to live a different lifestyle and I abandoned her and her mother and my daughter will be 24 next in two weeks. And before I passed away, I wanted to let her know who I was, why I did what I did and who I am now. Man, that's powerful, brother. Just looking at this, you know, this cover. And, and I mean, this is just my perspective of it. Looking at it, I see a man. You can only see his back with a hoodie on. He's got his hands tied behind his back with handcuffs. There's a demon looking at him. You know, there's a demon in the sky. Do you feel like that's what addiction was, bro? Just being kind of trapped under the devils? There's so many different perspectives on that cover. And the amazing thing today with technology and individuals that know how to maneuver around the Internet and, and, and Photoshop and do all those things. So that's like 20 different pictures Man. combined into one that me and this young lady from the United Kingdom put together. It's literal. And it's figurative, that cover. Yeah. It's literal in the fact that when I was in Belgium in the early 80s, I had a demonic attachment while I was living in, in, in the Holland area. And that's when I started seeing shadows and there was death in my life already at that young age. But that is a literal demonic entity that I was face to face with in my bedroom in, in Europe. Also, literally handcuffed. I rocked hoodies for years living in the Washington, D.C., uh, Northern Virginia, Maryland area, yeah. called the DMV. You know, Timberlands, hoodies, being incarcerated in multiple states. So that's literal. Me sitting down, being handcuffed, wait, here comes the bailiff. You know what I mean? You're not going to move until I tell you to move. And then the storms. I've been in multiple hurricanes, lived in Virginia for a long time, Florida and Louisiana. So I was around hurricanes, tornadoes. I do love destructive weather. I love cloudy days and rain. And then the bones that represent under the demons are the individuals that I lost and we lost to the addiction and to that lifestyle of, of being criminals. 
Man, I can I can see everything that you're talking about on this cover. For everyone who wants to check out the book, man, like I said, the notes are going to be in the show notes of the episode. You know, you can check out the cover. It's an incredible book. So, you know, dude... Going with fashion of the art cast, man, you know, kind of giving a little bit of, of insight of who you are as a human being and, and your background and stuff. Let's let's start from the beginning, Joe, for real, because I you're my homie, but I know a lot about you. But there's still I know there's still a lot of stuff to be uncovered. Bro. So what, where are you from? Are you from Tucson, Arizona? Born in Phoenix. You were born in Phoenix? I was born in Phoenix, bro. OK. My father was in the Air Force and we moved to Virginia, Langley, down in uh Southern region of Virginia. Went to Europe in the early 80s for four years. And that's when I got into soccer. I'm a little dude. You know, that Napoleon complex, little man syndrome, whatever <laughs> folks want to call that, you know. I mean, I'll be 45 years old on the 13th. Which Bro, is, I was just going to ask you that, man. I'll you be 45. You had a 24-year-old? You right. look like you're like hitting 30. So <laughs> it's why I appreciate that. But it's, I looked young my whole life. And when you're young, you don't want to look young. Yeah. When you get older, you appreciate, I appreciate looking in the mirror and being like, dang, man, like, thank you, Lord, after everything I went through for all those years and all the chemicals I put in my body, like, yeah. I feel like I'm getting younger and I'm looking younger. Yeah. So it's like the the Benjamin Buttons syndrome, yeah. which is a blessing because I used to get, I'm going to be real with you, I used to get pissed off, man, when I, I would get carded for matches and I'm 38 years old. <laughs> You know, I'm like, you go cart me for matches right now? Like, you look like you're a kid. I, I don't like that. But now I do. It's more appreciative. So going back, playing soccer in Europe, felt like I needed to overcompensate being a, a little dude. Okay. Went skiing in Austria. Was in a Mickey Mouse commercial in Amsterdam. Father was the leader of a band. Played sports for the armed forces and the air force. My mother was always there. I'm a mama's boy, so always clinging to mom, always clinging to mom. I got an older sister who lives in Cali right now. So I did a lot of really cool things while being a child, and I'm a very deep thinker, and I analyze, and I look around in my surroundings even as a child. Uh, I'm very sensitive to spirits. I'm very sensitive to people's energy, and I could take that energy on, and it could become destructive for me. So even at that age, I started getting into things like getting curious and starting a fire in the neighborhood at somebody's house. Wow. I started stealing at the age of six when my mother wasn't giving me Dutch money called Gilders back in the day. And all the little boys in the neighborhood, we'd go to this little Dutch candy shop and it smelled like Willy Walker in the chocolate factory. And you're like, oh my gosh, you got all these sweets. And there yeah. wasn't, a, I didn't have any money. And that was the first time that I was in a public place because I stole my mother's lighter before that and I returned it after I started that fire. And I felt left out. They got candy, they got sweets, I didn't. Yeah. And when that little old lady walked to the back of her house in the back of there and thinking that we're leaving because they opened the door, the bell rang, ding, 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 ding. I ran up in there and I just started handfuls of candy. Wow. And we ran back to the neighborhood, we ate them in their garage and they're like, you can't steal, that's not a good thing. And it gave me the biggest adrenaline rush I've ever had in my life besides that fire. Also, during that same time is when I started having sensitive situations with the unseen or into the spiritual realm. We used to walk past the graveyard every day to get to our bus stop. Okay. And I felt it every day walking past that graveyard and never said anything about it. I would always just look over there in that chain leak fence. And then eventually... It just started messing with me, provoking me, and then it ended up in my room, a demonic entity, which represents the literal uh, meaning of that book cover. The figurative meaning of that, real quick, is that I'm looking at myself in that chair, handcuffed, looking at my own demise, my own demons, my own actions, my own behaviors, my own thought process, my own lack of impulse control being impatient, being manipulative, being selfish in a negative way, looking at myself and especially, you know, you, you move forward in life. I move forward in life and, and start getting into the, the realm of methamphetamine years down the road Whoa. or it's a, like a portal to the gates of hell. 
Do you mind? Do you mind if we go back really quick, brother? So you know, I know you said that you were born in Phoenix and then you moved to PA, right? Is that where you went? Virginia. Virginia. What? What was? The, is that because your family was in military? Like, were you guys traveled around a lot? Yeah, my father was Air Force. So, like, I know you said you were born in Phoenix, but from that moment that you went from Phoenix to going all the way to Europe, that was how old was that? Like, what was the age when that happened? So, two years old in Phoenix, moved to Virginia for two years. Okay. Went to Europe went when to- I was four. Moved back to Phoenix when I was eight. Okay. And do you feel like there was anything that happened in your life at that time that that kind of pushed you to kind of be that little travieso starting fires and things like that? No? Born on Friday the 13th on a full moon, October 13th, (laughs) 1978. That'll do it. Here, I got this for you. (laughs) Dude, I have been waiting to use that button, bro. (laughs) That is awesome, bro. Yo, yes. All so right. happy Halloween to everyone out there. Yes. Okay, so so continue. I know you said that you were, you know, you started walking by this gravesite or whatever. Can you pinpoint what it was that you felt like this demon attached to you? Like, was it just the curiosity of opening up that? You know, because you said that this happened before the methamphetamine started, right? Yeah, I was six, seven years old. Methamphetamine came around, like legit living that tweaker lifestyle, came around when I was 32. So, I mean, you're talking 25 years later, three, 4,000 miles away. It's just I'm very sensitive. Yeah. When you got a bunch of kids playing football or sledding down that hill by the bus stop or we're walking to the bus stop, everybody's talking, goofing around, making fun of each other. And I'm staring at these headstones every day. Wow. Just staring at it, staring at it, staring at it. And it's a trip. You know, I just felt like something was... Hey, look over here. I didn't hear a voice, but it was an energy, and I feel energy. And I still feel energy. Yeah. And then when I woke up one morning at like 2, 3 in the morning, everybody was sleeping, and my father was traveling for the military. I knew somebody was watching me. I thought it was my older sister or my mom, and that's when I woke up. And there was a demonic entity just standing next to my bed, just Looked like a human head, but it was on hooves and burnt flesh and just creepy. Yeah. And I wet the bed and I freaked out and I pinched myself. And 16 hours later, the first chapter of the book since 16 hours, 16 hours later, my best friend Michael died after he got off the bus uh, on at the end of the day from school. But I wanted to tell him because I wanted to tell somebody besides my mom, but I didn't want to get made fun of. So I held that in, but he's like, what are you looking at? What are you looking for? I kept looking around, looking out the bus window. And he got off the bus before I could say something, and he died a few hours later in his front yard. How did he die? He was allergic to bees, and he put his juice outside, go get some more toys, came back out. There was a bee in the juice, drank it, and he got stung in his throat. Oh, no. And so it closed his, his airways, and he ended up passing away. So that got me thinking about life, right? And I'm like... My mom talks about Jesus. We don't go to church. My dad doesn't talk about Jesus. I'm praying what I know how. I cried every night because I didn't want my parents to die. That was like my biggest fear in life was my parents dying. And there was no voice, no light coming down. I'm God. Yeah. You know, why did you take Michael? That's weird. You know what I mean? Seven years old. That's some weird stuff. Like how would this guy like take a little a child? Why am I getting these evil, nothing but pure evil, to frighten my inner core and everything around my space to just tremble my life within that same time frame? And then I started seeing black masses out my window coming from the graveyard to our home at night, walking down the street. That's crazy. Yeah, man, it's a trip. I know, I know that that stuff is real too, man. I've experienced that like different situations in my life, and it's weird because like now that I'm older, I, I question if it was like, um, was there anything that I was into or anything that I was doing that opened up those portals? But I truly do feel like when you said at six years old, certain kids are just more sensitive to those types of things. Sure. I, I see, I see that with my son. I think my son is like that. He's very sensitive to emotions and regulation and just the way that he thinks and looks at people. So, like, 
I can t- I can totally see that. I remember waking up and and having those weird entities, seeing something like a like a black smoke almost. I go remember the you room, telling me, bro, and, and then just go, going this. out the window. You know, I remember being a kid and and feeling somebody's really sharp nails on the side of my stomach, saying die, die in my oh. ear as a little kid, dude. And and I remember running into my mom and dad's room. Like I I remember those things, bro. I I know for a fact. But I I honestly feel too. It's almost. Now that I'm older and I'm so faithful, it's almost flattering because it's like, man, he tried so hard. Oh, yeah. There must have been a reason. Yeah. Must now have he been says run. Yeah. Yep. Run. You are not allowed. Yeah. yeah. It's a trip. Life's a trip. The, the spiritual dimension, it's a trip for those people that acknowledge it and understand it because you can't explain it. Yeah. Why do you believe in God and why does he talk to you? And you can't explain that. There's, can't. No, there's no explanation for me, at least. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it's more like, how do you not believe in something greater than yourself? Right. Yeah, it's a trip. Life's a trip. Man. And and what did what, what did your parents say when you told, did you initially let them know what was going on? I ran into the hallway and I started puking while I was trying to scream. And then Cowboy, oh, our man. dog, started barking and my dad was gone. So my mom came out. She was like, JR, JR, there's nothing in there. She went and looked at my wardrobe because we have wardrobes yeah. in, in Europe. And there was nothing there. And she's like, there's nothing in there. There's nothing in there. You're fine. And I slept with her. And that's when I went to school the next day. And I'm just looking around, looking out the windows. What's wrong with you, Joel? What's going on? I didn't want to tell anybody. I didn't want to get made fun of. So went through all that. And then we moved back to Phoenix for three years. Was there any history of that? Like in your family? Did anyone ever else experience those types of things? Like your mom, your dad, your mom did? Grandmother. They all passed away in 2018. Wow. For sure. Very sensitive. Man, so okay. You got this gift, which I'm sure didn't look like that at first. Correct. Felt more like a curse, right? Yeah. And uh, you ended up moving back to Phoenix at what age? Eight. Eight years old. At this point, coming from another country, was it a culture shock for you coming back? Culture shock. Big time? Hot, nasty, gross, dry, 115 coming off the plane at Sky Harbor. And you didn't remember any of that when you left, huh? I didn't remember any of that at the age of two, man. <laughs> Grandparents were sitting out there waiting for us. And I'm like, man, this is this is different. Wow. It's hot at night. You can't smell any moisture. You can't smell any grass. I thought about stuff like that. Yeah. If, like very in tune with my environment at all times. Did those spirits, did that kind of stay away for a little bit? Like you got, got accl- acclimated to the hot ass weather out there in yes, Phoenix for I a little bit? I think they stayed back there. Yeah, thank yeah. God, huh? It was too hot out here. You know what I mean? <laughs> Even though they come from down somewhere where yeah. it's like a fire. But yeah, man, it, it, it just, it stopped. It really did. <laughs> like we ain't trying to go to the fire. <laughs> right? Yeah, straight up. All right. So, so how was everything, you know, growing up here? You know, were you, were you dabbling? You know, did you start drinking early on? Did you start? you know, dabbling in those types of things when you first got here? How did that initially start with you? I didn't do any of that. I was into sports, big time, uh, baseball cards, basketball cards, football cards, very organized in that, making sure everything was in mint condition. Meeting all my relatives who live in Arizona, and I got plenty. That's cool. And then seeing, like, my mom's siblings struggling with addiction, going to meet my my uncle in, in rehab here in Tucson. Seeing my aunt, who had been to Europe with us to stay, and she ended up going everywhere we went to be closer to my mom, who's her older sister, and she just clings to her. And I saw the Harleys and the Metallica shirts and, you know, the always the beer. My parents were alcoholics. My aunts, uncles, the the poor ones, the rich ones, everybody drank. Wow. All of them. And they would just have us kids leave. Here's 20 bucks. Don't come back. Until it's dark, so they could party. And biggest thing that happened when I was in Arizona during that three-year span is when I lived in Villa de Paz, 111th Indian School. I got into this fight with this kid that didn't like me, and he was a new student. And I got into a fight with him, and I was terrified, and I didn't know what to do, but I did it because I didn't want to be a chicken. And then when all those kids were surrounding, like, 60 kids on the golf course in a big circle— I did the crank, try to do the crank kick from Karate Kid because that was my favorite movie, the original. Yeah. And I missed. And everybody made fun of me. Not everybody, but the majority of people there made fun of me. And something took over for the, like, the first time in my life. And I, I blacked out. And he ended up in the hospital for weeks, peeing blood. 
because I beat him with a painted rock off the tee off green at the Via de Paz golf course. And how old were you at this time? Ten. Ten years old. Wow. And then I, the police came and destruction. I started doing things that people dared me to do. Started kissing girls. I like girls since I recognized what one was, like yeah. truly. Yeah. Back in Europe, that was my thing. So, man, that was the biggest thing, man. Uh, taking it over. Then his friends bullied me again. I was in school suspension. They came and bullied me and were like, you're a freak. You're a clown. Karate kid wannabe. And I was waiting for my other friends, my friends to come around and they just didn't show up after school and the bell rang. And I snapped again when they were making fun of me and I just chased them and caught them off guard. And they went to a house and I punched through the window and I pulled the kid out. And just started trying to stab him in the skull with glass. And it cut my wrist. Blood was down there running through the buses at the school because it was the cold sack was right across the street. My buddy Ryan came with the Iron Maiden shirt on. He was like, don't do it. And I punched. But I just, I, I lose it still. You know, when people get uncomfortable, we react differently. Yeah, absolutely. We react differently. I know you said I heard you a little bit ago say that your parents were both alcoholics, mm -hmm. your mom and your dad. So that was in when you were in Europe as well, too. Right. Oh, yeah. Do you feel now that you're older, more mature, that you see things as a spiritual being? Do you feel like maybe their alcohol use is what allowed those things to come into your home? Possibly. Do you ever think about that? Yeah, possibly. Yeah. There was a lot in our bloodline and the generations before us in our bloodline that that goes on that we don't know about. Yeah. No idea. Absolutely. I got family that came from Ireland. I got family that came from the Germanic region, whether it's Scandinavian or Norwegian, German, European, Jewish, uh, Polish, mm -hmm. Czechoslovakian, Russian, Sonora, Mexico. You know, so I got native, Baltic, Mexican, and then white. And then you just think about all those ethnicities and everything that everybody went through and how they dealt with things and what spiritual attachments they had yeah and their wherever they came from yeah and there's so many different reasons i think it's super interesting like to hear you say that you know because uh, especially with so many different cultures and things inside inside of your body that you have like the generational curses all of those things just come together you know what i'm saying like the anger all of those things that you were talking about man yeah. it's kind of uh it's uh, i don't think a lot of people really think about that type of stuff it's deep because, say, a family member of mine who has the same DNA and it's running through my veins had traumatic events as a child, trauma, like traumatic, traumatic stuff. Yeah. And the way they deal with that and the way it changes their body chemistry, their brain chemistry, and the DNA itself because of the stress and, and how vibrant it impacts our nerves in our body and then conceive children. Mm. Then add alcohol to it. You can add peyote to it, opium, you know, the mind altering substances that were available at that time. Because opium is really what ran the world. You know, the men that created this country and came from Europe founded the Industrial Revolution, but it was all financed through opium. And then they opened banks, JP Morgan, Chase, all that. Those men are the ones that. We're the biggest drug dealers on the planet. It's a trip yeah. to understand that. But then individuals go through traumatic events, start drinking a lot, using these substances to, to escape. And then now it's in their system. They conceive children. Children go through a traumatic experience. They cling on after peer pressure or what have you and then start. I mean, so true. It, it's wild, man. I got five children now and, and, I sit back and I watch and I analyze for the three that I was in active addiction that I'm a father to, and then the two that I wasn't in active addiction when their mothers conceived them. Yeah. It's a trip. I look at those two and then I look at the other three and I see the anxiety and, and how that could be applicable to their anxiety, depression, genetic diseases, disorders. It's a trip, man. No, nah, man, I, I think that's incredible. And, and the fact that you're able to not only 
verbalize that, but the fact that you've thought that, you know how many people, so many people are so worried about their phone, dog. How many likes they're getting right now? You're over here right. thinking about some of the deepest things, bro. That's what it's all about. Yeah, that's why is. we've always been homies too. You yeah, know so saying? we talked about those spiritual yeah. experiences that you had. Yeah, those deep things, yeah. man. So you came here, you started going to school. I know you said that you got into sports. How were you in school? Were you a good student? Hard for me to learn. I was in a class with developmentally disabled class. Sometimes, not all the time. I was a class clown. I always wanted girls to like me. No doubt. Mm -hmm. First girl that ever kissed me was my sister's age and was actually a girl that my sister knew. And I was at the water fountain in Phoenix. There was no hallways. So you walk out of the classroom and I was drinking water. She came up to me and she gave me a kiss on my lips. My buddies were all like, oh my God, oh my God. And I felt like squints on Sandlot. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I felt like squints on Sandlot, and I actually looked a lot like squints on Sandlot with my <laughs> buck teeth and the glasses and all that. So, that guy I, was a G, bro. That was a G that move. Was, that was my guy. That was I looked just like him. But it, and then we ended up like going to Mexico a lot. So I was on the ocean and just thinking about Michael passing away and thinking about the demonic presence and thinking about why relatives party the way they party out here and why my aunt's boyfriend was threatening to blow up the house and didn't know it was connected all to methamphetamine back in the 80s. Oh, man. You had siblings and stuff growing up, too? My older sister. Just you and her? Right. Okay. Yeah. Then I had individuals that I considered to be brothers that were able to, like, walk into our home. Actually, there was really only, like, one person ever that could walk into our home, my parents' home in Virginia. We moved out there, and, you know, he succumbed to the gang violence and... Okay. Yeah. Oh, man, so I'm it starts to get, to get deep. Okay. Yeah, that book gets it gets super deep, man. It gets super graphic. Took me six years to put it on paper, man. Man, I'm excited for people to listen to it. You know, going back and forth. When did you start using? Because I, I I think it's 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 very interesting to me too. Was there a part of your life where you felt like I'm never going to touch a substance? Of course. Isn't that the trip? How that happened? Bear program, just say no. Yeah. Smokey the Bear. There was all kinds of programs out there with the Reagan administration. And so we go to Virginia. My father working at the Pentagon. We're right outside Washington, D.C. They call it DMV, D.C., Maryland, Virginia. And it's a different culture, man. It, it, it's super different. How old are you at this time? 12. Started going to middle school, getting out class in every sport. Little dude. But I was good at everything I'd ever done. I've been good at everything I've ever done. Never the best, except for today. Yeah. I'm the best at not getting high and drunk for the last 330 million moments because I like to count my, my time in moments, which is a second. In 10 years, you know, it's over 330 million moments without me running away, getting high, mm. and drinking. The 330 million moments. And I love that stuff, man. That's cool. It's a trip. So to answer your question, it's when I didn't make the basketball team in, in high school. I played AAU ball. I played boys and girls club ball. Um, started hanging out in predominantly black neighborhoods. Always at the rec center. Every day I lived at the rec center playing ball. And parents always had their alcohol after work. They were functioning. They could drink tequila, drink beers to chase it down every day after work. Always had wood in the fireplace, always had food on the table, always had a clean home, a loving home. I just, once I got a taste of their alcohol because of depression, of not being picked onto a team. Matter of fact, when I went to high school, I went to a high school that none of my friends went to because they changed the zoning, the county zoning areas, and I wanted to go to Woodbridge where my sister went and all my friends went, and they said, no, you're going to school called Garfield and I'm like depressed and anxious all over again man all over again so I go to this high school and I'm super anxious and I am overwhelmed and it's like an ocean of humans 3,500 kids that look some of them look like adults I put in the book that the girls look like playboy models and, and the playboy magazines I was stealing from my daddy when I was 12 years old just overwhelmed I get overwhelmed a lot. Yeah. Super shy. Tried out. Guys on the basketball court. We live by Georgetown University. You know, you got Virginia Cavaliers, Virginia Tech. You got Maryland. All these schools and a lot of these kids are 
have the ability to go play for these colleges. And I'm out there on the court trying to play with them. And they're like, are you sure you're in the right school? Uh, middle school or elementary school is on over there because I was so small and uh, nobody really knew me. So I wanted to make, make a name for myself and, and uh, de- determined, tenacious. I saw a lot of kids tripping off LSD outside the school, smoking weed, drinking outside. You had your stoners. Everybody was segregated. You had your own, your own world. The middle school was preps, jocks, and you had your youngsters that were trying to figure out where they fit in. And I just, one day I decided to steal my parents' tequila in the morning. My father worked, went to the Pentagon. My mom went to work at the bank and I poured tequila in a little cup, picked a bunch of cigarette, half cigarette butts into a, a bag. I went to the, the bus stop and I just started drinking. And it, and it did something for my life. I, I became, I don't want to be shy no more. I'm like, I got a lot of potential for people to know me. And the alcohol was exactly what I needed to get out of myself and to out of my shell. And it was a wrap. This was middle school. It was a nope. This was the early, this was high school. This, this was ninth grade. School. Ninth grade. I lost my virginity to uh, my neighbor who I'd seen for years. So it was 10th grade that I started doing all this stuff because she was in ninth. Man. And she was on the bus. She said, Come see me after, after school and she, when she walked past. As soon as I got a taste of that and a taste of alcohol and a taste of tobacco, there was no more baseball cards. And it, it was a wrap. It, it, I, Addiction runs deep in my family with alcoholism and and drug addiction. And I just went from there. It it opened a whole new avenue for me, and I appreciated it more than anybody could ever fathom. Like, I know exactly where I'm at. And my sister was dating a gang member that I used to watch at the the rec center. I used to sit back and watch. When I wasn't playing, I watched them run five on five. I'm like, man, these dudes are respected. They just got a swag about them. You know, I want to be like them. Yeah. And then one day there were two of them were sitting on my couch talking to my dad, who's a respected military man at the Pentagon, talking to my mom and then my sister. And they're like, hey, come and, come meet your sister's boyfriend. And I'm, he said, yo, I be seeing you over there playing little dude. He's like, you keep on practicing. You can be balling with us. Blew my head up. Doom, 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 doom. I'm like, why are these gang members? I'm in my head trying to come up with all the situations. And you felt accepted. He put me under his wing. Never wanted me to get affiliated with the gang. How much older was your um, was he to you? Like your sister, was she older than you? My sister's older than me. She just turned 48. Okay. So, I'll, I'll be 45 on October 13th. But her boyfriend was even older. Yeah, when you're, when you're younger, those even the five-year age gap is yeah. like significant. Significant. Because he was driving like an act vigor. Yeah. He had the flat diamonds on his neck. You know, people were like heavy chains. His was really light, but it was pure. Man. Going to Georgetown Hoyers game, he would take me to go watch Allen Iverson play. He got me a shirt, said "Go hard or go home," and then he named me Omen, O M E N. And when he did that, again, I'm a deep, think- deep thinker. I'm like Omen. I look it up. It's like prophetic balance between good and evil. And I'm like Joel, and then Omen. I'm like I'm a Libra on the scales of good and bad. Friday the thirteenth, born on a weekend of a full moon. I see these demons. <laughs> <laughs> I can hit that. Oh. <laughs> it's a trip, but it ended up. Some parents, oh, I'm going to say this. Some parents are so strict, they don't let their kids out. Yeah. They're afraid for their, their daughters to lose their virginity. They're afraid that their sons will succumb to the peer pressure of society in high school. So a lot of people homeschool their kids and hope for the best. Some of our parents, some parents don't want their kids at all. And they sell them off into the underground sex trade, whatever. And then some parents are cool and they just give their children a leash or a fishing line. We're on the, we're on the hook. But they let that line just go and go and go. You want to hang out with your friends? Go ahead. Why? Maybe so they could drink after work. They could just chill, have the confinement of the home next to the fireplace, drink their tequila, smoke their cigarettes, watch what they want to watch. But they know where their kids are until they don't know where their kids are. And that's what happened with me and my sister. They allowed us to do what we wanted. They wanted us to do good in school. But they allowed that fishing line to go so long that the hook broke. And we escaped that hook. And we just kept going, kept going, kept going. I'm talking years and years of fishing line just kept going. Your parents, when you say the fishing line... 
did they try their best to like know who your friend's parents were, where you were at? Like, did they think that you guys were safe or was it just uh go ahead, do what you want to do? Man, my parents are cool, man. To this day, my parents are just cool. I got cool ass parents. Yeah. Ended up being like, cool. She's going to a friend's house. He's going to a friend's house. We're chilling, drinking, doing what we want to do. Call in, check in. Not really sit down and meet the parents. Not not that type of ball game. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, go to sporting events. Like we had everything we needed in life. My parents were just a cool ass couple, you know. And my sister started hanging around this group when she was in high school. And I started hanging around this group when I went to a different high school. It just ended up being the way the world is. The people I started to connect with on the basketball court and in the same high school were connected to my sister at the other high school. Okay. And he never wanted me to get affiliated. But I, again, I'm tenacious. I'm like, I'm going to get what I want. So I started doing things and hanging around those youngsters that were affiliated with that gang. And I started introducing these little cliques. I would smoke weed, do LSD, Sherm, they call it out here, D.C. area. You call it Illy Momo, Buck Naked, Love Boat, formaldehyde. Now you dip your cigarette in it, you let it dry, you smoke it. I felt like I was a prophet. Damn. Listening to Bone Thugs and Harmony, thinking I'm a prophet. I didn't know you like to get wet. You know, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's so what it reminds like me of. a magic marker, and I, I did that for 10 years. Man. You know, it did it, it, it took its toll on me, man. Did uh were, were your parents aware when you started using? Heck no. Not at all. Not at all. Would they have been pissed off if they knew? Of course. Of course. Like I was still in my daddy's Playboy magazines and 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 pouring out their tequila. And every morning my breakfast was my mom's half smoked Marlboro one hundreds and their tequila sitting at the bus stop. And then I wasn't taking the bus no more. Now I'm going out there and I'm dating this beautiful girl with the same last name. They're like, how did this little white boy get this freaking, this girl like this? And I, I, they were writing notes, putting them in my pocket, putting them in my Phoenix Suns hat, putting on my Phoenix Suns hat, repping Phoenix all the way out to the Virginia, D.C. area. And I I take it off and it would fall on the ground and open it up. She was like, you are just so stupid. You are an idiot. <laughs> but I like how stupid you are. You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah. dang, she's pretty. She's like, you are a freaking goofball. And it's the confidence. I teach a lot about specific things. And the difference in one human being of our confident self and our not so confident self is two completely different energies. Because when we're not confident, we're in our head. Absolutely. And there's people Absolutely. out there that walk the red carpet or they're out there playing on the NBA. But when they're not confident, they don't play for a season. It's a trip. And it's talked about more so nowadays than any other time in, in our history of this civilization specifically, where it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to not play in the U.S. Open when you're, when you're scheduled to play in the U.S. Open. Or you're the number one golfer on the planet and you're taking time off. You're the number one Olympic athlete on the planet and you're not going to attend. It's because of pressure. We put so much pressure on ourselves these days that it can't break us. For a season or forever. But just going all the way back, confidence and not confident. I had confidence. Why did I have so much confidence being a four foot eight, four foot eleven, eighty pound dude in high school amongst these big fellas and these beautiful girls? What made me so confident? Alcohol. Period. It does something to my family when we put it in our system that we're free of the bondage of shyness. It's a freaking trip. My dad played sports and he drank. He traveled Greece. He traveled Europe playing sports and for the, the Air Force. And then he drank. And my mom would just travel with him and drank and with all the women. And, and then he played in a band. Lead singer. He's got albums. He was drinking. Dude was chilling. Everything was contingent on the alcohol. All of it. Wow. So you found your confidence. At this time, I know you said you were experimenting with LSD and stuff too, right? I wasn't experimenting, brother. You were just going all in? I was in. going. I was eye drops, sugar cubes, let me lick the bottle, cut the eye drop bottle open, cut it halfway down, lick the insides, get everything. Like dope fiend, brother. Do you feel, was there any like fear? Of what? Of trying something new? Like, you know, I mean, you drink, right? But it's so socially acceptable depending right. on where, where you are in the world. 
you know, certain drugs, you know, natural drugs or whatever. But like, I always wonder if there was ever that fear when you started getting into things that were heavier. If I wasn't drinking, I wouldn't have done none of it. Yeah, I guess I that's feel, true. I feel. I guess that's true. I feel. I can't say for sure, but I truly feel that if I hadn't started drinking my parents' liquor, I wouldn't have tried anything. Alcohol is the gateway to me. It's not a plant called marijuana. I'm going to smoke weed. Then I'm going to put a screen mask on and I'm going to run up in a jewelry store and I'm going to rob that. I'm not going to go get a prostitute or girls on back pages and start pimping them out so I can have sex with them when I feel like it. They're going to give me money and they're going to give me dope. I'm not doing that from smoking weed and I don't smoke weed. I'm too paranoid. I'm already a paranoid dude from everything that happened, but I'm a CBD advocate, but straight up alcohol is the gateway. Wow. If I drink today after 330 million moments of not drinking or doing dope. And counting. And I drink today, you're going to hear about it. I work, in, I work down the road. You work here, you'll hear about it. Because that's how destructive I become. And I have a name for myself here in recovery now. Through the eyes of God and all this, you would hear about it. Those of you that know me that work here, y'all would hear about it. And it wouldn't be me telling you. That's mm. how destructive I become. And people be like, yo, Joel went off the hook. He's off the meat hook. Like he went all out. And that's how I get. It's the gateway. Because if I drink today, I'm going to my uncle's house down the street. I'm picking up dope. I'm getting some strippers. And I'm going hard in the paint. I don't want to do that right now. Yeah. I'm chilling, bro. Like I'm relaxing. So you're out there. You're finding yourself as, you know, you're growing up into this young man. You've already had a taste of females, of the lifestyle. You're getting in cool with gangs, people that are cool in your eyes, people right. that are that are help filling that that void that you feel on the inside of yourself. Exactly. How long did that continue, the fun part of it, until it became a hindrance, bro, when it started affecting other people around you? 98, because I got affiliated. I got affiliated. Street, street life, just in it. You were hard. Masked up. Little dude. Tiny little dude. People knew the name Omen. Well, people saw me and they met me and I said, I'm Omen. When they asked my name, they'd be like, there's no way that that's you. Like, you look like a pipsqueak. Like, you look like squints. You're not the dude that I've heard of that did this and did this and did this. It's whatever, bro. You shouldn't use that name. Somebody else in this gang has that name. You probably shouldn't use that name because they might find out. And I said, no, I'm like legit. I'm him. And they're like, there's no, there's, they're baffled. For years, there's no freaking way that that's you. It's me. It's me, bro. And yes, I did that. And I'll explain to you exactly what happened that night. And then they'll be like, what the heck? That's exactly what we saw. I'm like, that's me. I just masked up. Blacked out like the omen. It started affecting people when I got two females pregnant. And I learned about it the same day. Mm. And the same night. But then I got caught in a stolen car. I got incarcerated. <laughs> Go ahead, bro. You have to do a lot of those. Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I'm using all the buttons on right? you today, dog. That's Thank you. Up, bro. <laughs> there you go. Hey, that yeah. was all him. That wasn't yeah. even the sound effect. I'm telling you, man. And so it just all became lies. Lying to my parents. Um, I'm drinking in school. I'm smoking weed before I go to school. Mm. I, I'm assaulting teachers. I'm assaulting students. And it's all fueled off of desire to make a name for myself, tenacity, alcohol. It just became embodied in Omen. And the more I am embodied in this character that became a reality, that, that good kid that my parents knew of was starting to disappear, but they were in denial. And my mother more so than my pops, because my pops... He's like, I'm not putting up with this. I work at the Pentagon. I could lose my security clearance. Oh, man. They still didn't know I was in the gang until they ended up seeing the tattoo. Um, the brother that I was talking about that was killed, that I considered a brother, he, he was an Irish cat, you know, amongst large African-American population in this gang. And he ended up getting murdered by the two individuals I considered to be my best friends at the time. They went down there and they killed him. And again, I didn't talk about it amongst the off-brand people around there because I did have friends that weren't affiliated, considered off-brands. But when the, the feds 
figured out that it was within our own gang that executed him on the side of the road in Alabama, it really got me thinking like, okay, well now they're in prison. He's dead. People are getting killed in these other gangs that we all went to school with. I just became destructive, man. I'm just a total destruction. Like me sharing my story around and sharing my testimony, which I have for the last 10 years. That's an hour long conversation. People are like, yeah, I know Joel's story. I know Joel's story. It's like nothing. I I spent six years writing that book. Every word mattered when I put it in that book. It's over like 141,000 words put on paper while working at the CRC, while working at the ARC, while having child after child after child after getting clean with my now ex-wife. I was so determined, just like I was my whole life, to do soccer field in Europe, skiing in Austria. I'm going to place. It doesn't have to be gold, which I never was. But I'm going to place. I'm going to be up there. I'm not going to be in the back. So I made a name for myself. That little dude, Scrappy. Oh, you want to start pushing me around because I'm small in the soccer field? I'm going to kick you in the shin. I'm going to elbow you in the lip. Like, it was that way my whole life. Man. So the tenacity has always been, it's always stuck with me. Like, I'm going to get what I want when I want it. But it's just, I got to do it in a more productive way now, in a more healthy way now. Because I don't want to get incarcerated again. I don't want to be locked into a mental hospital again. So I got to figure out a more spiritual way of doing it in a, in a, in a patient manner. Sorry, I go off. I go off. No, no, no. Me. You're good, bro. That's um, t- We should call this podcast ADHD because I do there the same go, bro. thing, bro. Yeah, I go day. off topic, but we always <laughs> we always get back, bro. We got we always get back. But I mean, it, it's important to explore different different things because everybody. I mean, that's the beauty of God is He makes all these amazing people, and everybody has a unique story. Everybody's story is a little bit different, you know. And 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 listening. To the things that you've experienced. I mean, for one, it's a miracle that you're here today. Amen. It's incredible because your story is going to be able to help so many other people. People that have gone through maybe not as bad and for people that have gone through even worse, exactly. believe it or not. you know, Exactly. When it came to the situation with you using and, and just getting deeper in this, it's, 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 it's so nuts how the perspective of people change too as you're older because... I'm I'm listening to you talk about your insecurities as being a shorter guy and how you always had to feel like you had to overcome for that, right? right. And how you always felt like you kind of didn't measure up, no pun intended. I love you, bro. But that's all. <laughs> <laughs> right? Get it, but to me, but to me, I always think of the movie Casino. I think of the movie Goodfellas. The one that I was afraid of the most was Joe Pesci. <laughs> like, right. you know yeah. what I'm saying? And and, yeah. and I don't know if it's just fueled like it's like it's like a passion, bro. Ain't nobody gonna beat that passion. You are super passionate about everything yeah. that you do, right? You know, and and I mean, and, and it's crazy how as you're growing up, you don't even see your self worth. You don't see really all the amazing features, all the amazing qualities, of passion, all of these things. You don't see it because this insecurity has taken the forefront of the direction that you're going to in your life. Spot on, perfectly said, because it's true. And because it's me, I don't see it. Yeah. I don't see Denzel Washington thinking that way. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm the greatest. Yeah. He's going through things too. Mm-hmm. You know, he's get up there and he's got YouTube videos talking about, you know, people laying on their deathbed and wasting their talent and the spirits of their talents looking down on the deathbed mm. and saying, why did you waste me? Now I'm going to be buried with you. You wasted me. I had, you had the opportunity to utilize me as a spirit of talent, your whole life, you were so stuck in your freaking head that you never used me. And now I'm being buried with you. And then you go back to movies like that. We talk about Bronx Tale. Robert De Niro is the bus driver, just trying to make ends meet for his family so they don't get caught up in the chaos of the mob in the streets of New York. His son's dating a black girl, which was a no-no back then. But the kid was in love. Same thing for me. White kid out there. In love with this light-skinned black shorty from, from West Philly that went to my high school. That wrote that letter and put it in my freaking Phoenix Suns snow cap. Walking through her neighborhood. Fine as can be. You got these dudes sitting out on the, on the front porch. Smoking weed, smoking blunts. What you doing out here, white boy? What up, white boy? You can't hit that, right? Hey, why are you, why are you kicking it with him? You know he can't hit that, right? So as an individual, you talk about Joe Pesci overcompensating. Going above and beyond to prove facts 
of how we feel about ourselves. No, I belong just because I'm not black or Puerto Rican or Asian. You know what I mean? I belong. Here, give me that. Bow. Give me that. Bow, 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 bow. I'm going to let y'all know. For what? To belong. Yeah. I've always wanted to belong. Too small to be on a soccer field. You're not going to make that. Okay. You do belong on a soccer field. Sorry. We got to move back to uh, the United States. What the heck? I just felt like a sense of belonging on a soccer field because they put me a goalie because I was being a little too rambunctious on the field. <laughs> so they put me a goalie and it worked for me. That's good. Being like a child with autis- uh, autism, like a genius in something, right? Yeah. Just phenomenal. You got kids building pictures of Elvis, images of Elvis and Marilyn Monroe Jesus out of Rubik's Cubes, like 10,000 different Rubik's Cubes in their floor like they would be in here and they build the image out of Rubik's Cube. How? What? That's crazy. How do you even think of something like that? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, how do you even think of How does that even... But people do that. I know. But then at the drop of a, a, a general's orders, my father's like, start packing up. We're leaving in three weeks. Go back to the United States. Cool. Phoenix got all my friends. Just got kissed in the mouth by this older girl at the water fountain. Me and the kid that I got in a fight with and ended up almost killing him with that painted rock. He and I ended up being really cool. You know what I mean? Like it happens. Life happens like that sometimes. You go through something, you despise somebody. It might not be you're despising them still, but maybe it was a reason that you didn't acknowledge in your own brain because they were just alike. It's it's amazing when you hear Jesus talking about parables, right? There's so many things where he talks about that just it like it hits you because it just hits a chord. And it's amazing how God works in every aspect of this world, right? Your situation and, and my homeboy Jamal that was in here yesterday, very similar, man. I mean, listening to the uprooting and having to reroot and uprooting and having to reroot. If you did that to a plant, bro. You're going to jeopardize the integrity of that plant. That plant is not either it's either going to grow ridiculously crazy or it's going to stunt its growth because you can't take roots right. from a plant. Once it's been established in the soil, take it out and put it somewhere. Maybe you can do it once, right. maybe twice. Yeah. If you continue to do that, the plant loses the nutrients. It can die from that. Yes. And I think as humans, we're very similar. Like We have to feel grounded. Mm-hmm. We have to feel well rooted in our community and friends and uh, being social sports, right. yeah. you know, and, and I'm sure that played a toll on you too. Like, just like you said, having Huge. to uproot oh, man. over and over again. So didn't realize in Phoenix, I was two years old moving to Virginia. Yeah. Go to Europe. I start realizing things like there are Armenian terrorist organizations threatening to bomb the school every freaking day. And they end up bombing the Turkish embassy in, in Belgium, assassinating the Turkish ambassador. Like at that age, I remember all these things because like, why are we leaving school? Just like, cool, we get to get out of class. Cool. But that was kindergarten to 12th grade in Europe because you got the United States children. You got children for Germany, United Kingdom, Canada, four different countries all in one school. That's thousands of children, huge international school. They're like, bomb it. So there's like soccer, skiing, Michael dies, demonic entity. I wasn't like, oh my God, we got to go back. But I was nervous to go back to America. And then I created this own little life. It's in my book. I created this own little life for myself. My dad's like three weeks from moving to Virginia. <laughs> what? Going back to Virginia? Yeah, it's a place called the Pentagon. I'm going to be working there. What? What? Culture shock again. So you go from Europe, culture shock, but there's everything in that international school. There's no racism in my family. When it comes to my mom, my dad, my sister, and I. You know what I mean? It's just not. Yeah. We're the only white family in in a black neighborhood in Hampton, Virginia. Only white family. Didn't care. I'm like, whatever. You know what I mean? Just started liking little black girls. It was just what I grew up around. Then you go to Phoenix. I'm like, oh, snap. I might see one black girl in my school. Now I got a plethora of Mexican females. You know what I mean? (laughs) Plethora. So... Then you turn around, and then when you go to the Washington, D.C. area, it's predominantly black. I mean, that's our high school played against T.C. Williams. Remember the Titans. Mm. Every year. It's just one of those teams down the street, Alexandria, Virginia. Like, we're going to play T.C. Williams. That's where the Underground Railroad was, Woodbridge. It went straight through every just the history. I'm a deep thinker about that. Eventually moving to Louisiana. The history of what? Civil War. What made you move out there? Oh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it gets, it, gets, it gets deep, brother. Okay. You know? um, 
Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to cut so, you so, off, bro. I just have yeah, all these good. ideas, bro. So I stole a car, getting incarcerated. I didn't tell on the gang member who allowed me to use the stolen car. And he thought I was going to because that was my first test being incarcerated back in 1998. And he was like, shit, Oma's going to tell for sure. Why did he think that? Because there's older cats and cats in our generation that did get locked up and they were telling on folks. Well respected, telling quick, mm -hmm. telling super quick. So fictitious plates, brand new car off the lot. I'm driving it to be cool with these girls just so I can sleep with them. Drop her off, pick up another one, go to a park, try to get a little something. Didn't work out that way. Too drunk. Detectives were watching. So I didn't say nothing. And it blew his mind. This little fuck, this little dude, he ain't even say nothing. He didn't say anything. I took the rap. And he was like, wow. We got, we're connected. You know what I mean? He and I, well respected. This man did a lot of years in a penitentiary. A lot of years in a penitentiary. And we're still very, very close now that he's out and he's in that area. But people don't forget that stuff. I'm just trying to make a, make a name for myself, man. I, I, I was on a mission to make a name for myself. If I had to be spray painted on the bridge from Springfield, Virginia to Washington, D.C., where all the corridors go from 95 to 195, 295, 395, 495, all in one intersection on the interstate to go to different cities, Baltimore, Philly, Delaware, Dover, whatever. I want my name on that. Get up there and spray paint Omen and put the gang signs everywhere. And people are driving past it like that little knucklehead. The hell? That's crazy. This little dude. I was like, I told you I'm going to do it. I told you I'm going to do it. So then the two girls ended up calling me saying I'm pregnant, Joel. One was a friend, and then one was a, like a, a new girlfriend. Um, so back in 98. So I come out to Arizona. All right, so we missed a lot. That's the whole point of the book. Like, I got pulled out of school. I was in love with my girlfriend. Like, absolutely in love with her. And the one I was walking through the neighborhoods with, uh, gang members would come up, put guns to my face scare me out of the neighborhood, but I wouldn't leave. They'd be like, why are you messing with this white boy? You know what I mean? Like, I was always at her house. Then I'm hanging around that neighborhood. Wasn't at home anymore. And my parents were still cool with it. I think I'm still at the Boys and Girls Club playing basketball all the time, mm. you know, in denial and, and, and working and making money, making a living, but drinking every day. Ended up being in situations where people got shot in the neighborhood and I was in that area. So people were starting to see my face more and more. And then people were like, yo, that's so-and-so's little brother. He's the one that gave me the shirt, Omen. He named me Omen. He gave me that alias, Omen. It's my sister's boyfriend at the time. Just fueled it. Omen, Omen, Omen. That's little, that's so-and-so's little brother. It just fueled it. Now in high school, people are like, yo, that's so-and-so's little bro. So I'm growing my hair. Girls are braiding my hair. And then you'd look at him, and he's darker than me, but he's light-skinned. And they're like, oh, it could be. Got the same hairstyle, rocking the same shoes. He's looking up to him. That is so-and-so's little brother. Yo, you're so-and-so's little brother. Yeah, that's my older brother. All meantime, he's not my older brother. I'm just a little brother of the girl that's been dating him. But I allowed that to fuel. Mm -hmm. Then I get affiliated. Then people start seeing me. Yo, this is legit. And the people that made fun of me when I was in, in middle school, buck teeth, rap boy, can opener. I mean, I always had friends. I, I've always had friends my whole life. But people still make fun of me. I had parents make fun of me. Kids' moms. Why are you messing with that rap boy? You know, stuff like that. And it, and it just it fueled my fire and to, to become something. And since I wasn't going to be an athlete because I gave up, and basketball was my life, my escape from everything. Some people snowboard. Some people ski. Some people do music. Some people act. Mine was basketball. Everything. My whole anxiety, depression, everything's gone. You give me a ball, it's gone. I don't think about it. You give me a ping pong ball and a paddle, I'm not thinking anymore. You give me a tennis ball and a racket, I'm not, I'm not thinking no more. So it's something to escape. So I ended up, there's a, a culture out in the D.C. area called Go-Go Music. And it's like jazz, funk era in the 60s, 70s. And then it turned into a different kind of era where neighborhoods and gangs created bands. So it was like Battle of the Bands, Northeast D.C., Backyard band. So you had Northeast Groovers, Backyard, you had Junkyard, Rare Essence, Pure Elegance. You had all these different bands. And people in my brothers and my gang, they had a band. So always around Pitbulls, Blunts, 
female shaking that ass, 40s, motorcycle street rockets for people that rode street rockets. And it was just every day sitting outside chilling. It was a lifestyle. So I was staying at different people's houses everywhere, but I was, I had motives. Let's get in the neighborhood where my girlfriend lives so I could sneak up in there all the time. And then Timmy got killed. I got kicked out of school. My parents sent me to Apache Junction, Arizona. I came out here, started dabbing in meth back in 1997. And it's all connected because the people I was doing methamphetamine with, that's this little dude. Never done it in my life. You said that that situation with that girl, that was back in 98. Yeah. But you were here in Phoenix in 97. So I left her. The only reason why. So my parents, Halloween 1996, because I was here when the Wildcats won the Oh, yeah, that was the championship. Wild. That was wild. And then they had the, the UFO lights in Phoenix that same year. Yeah. I'm a numbers dude. So I didn't, well, my, I did something in Halloween with my gang. It was the most violent night of my life with me committing violence to other people. That same night, my parents said, no, 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 no. You're walking upstairs. Get your ass down here. Sit on the couch. They're sitting by the fire. They got their drinks. Mom's smoking cigarettes. They're chilling. They're relaxing. My, my sister's out. I come in, I got fatigues on, Timberland's black shirt. I always turned the shirt around so it didn't say omen and have all the, the freaking um, gang symbols. So I, I was mindful of it, but I still made mistakes because I was high. And that's how my parents ended up finding out I was in a gang because I came in with the wife beater on and tattoo. And that's after Timmy got killed, after my sister's stories of things that happened with her boyfriend and my, my mentor. But they pulled me out of school. After I assaulted a kid, I assaulted a teacher. There was acts of violence with me and another gang member over my girl from a different gang. And they said, you're going to Arizona and you have no choice. And I'm like, no way, because I'm thinking they're going to go after my girl because they love her and she's sexy. And I'm like, that's what I thought. But then the spirit told me so. Shh, just go. Look at all the crimes you just committed. You've been told on in Phoenix when you got in a fight with that kid. Your friends told on you. These other kids told on you, and it was a lie because I wasn't even involved. I was just there, and they did it, but they wanted to. So I've been told on plenty of times in my life at that point. And my parents were like, you're, you're going on a plane. Pack your stuff. You're going to Apache Junction to live with your grandparents. And that was a culture shock. And then I did a bunch of bad things to my family out here when they just kept passing me around. They tried their best. They tried their best. I went from Apache Junction to Scottsdale. Good families. Good families. Stealing from them all. Like, just going in there as a thief and stealing from them all. Came out here. It's, it's a lot, bro. It's a lot that went in when I was here in Arizona for that short period of time. And then I ended up on Pantano on 5th over here without anybody because family just didn't. He's stealing. He's smoking weed. He's drinking. I, mean, I got my GED when I was out here. I did get my first job at Little Caesars in Scottsdale off McDowell. Like, it was, I, I did some cool things. But at the same time, I was, I was, I wanted what I wanted when I wanted it. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter. I'll smile on your face and be like, I, I love you. And then grandparents will go to a funeral to bury my great grandmother. As soon as they left me in their house alone, I went through the house, stole his guns, got caught. Karma is a mofo, man. Man. So ended up getting involved in methamphetamine out here in I'm Pantano on Fifth. I was having sex with all these girls in this Parma complex because I'm different. I'm talking different. I'm wearing Timberlands. I'm wearing fatigues. Like, where does this little kid come from? But it was my confidence. Why was I confident? Because I was drinking. You were the forbidden fruit, probably. <laughs> right. I was the omen. You know yeah. what I mean? I was the omen. I was different. Yeah. And uh, talk to well-respected people in these cities I went to. Well-respected people that were well-known in the street life, in the drug trade. Like, I was in these situations all the time. And the people I ended up using with in that apartment complex were connected to my uncle. Out here. It's a trip. It's so a pass me the phone, bro. I don't want to talk to him. I don't know who this is. We're Rob going through ATM machines out here. I'm with this guy. He's going through ATM machines every Wells Fargo, pulling out $300 by putting pen on a piece of paper, putting it in the envelope, and having the girls or whoever tweakers four-digit pin code. And you're putting in fake money, and it's reading. The ATMs are reading it. We're getting $300 from every freaking... And then dude got me. Dude set me up and got me. Pulled all that out of my bank account that I didn't even have any money in. But my uncle ended up coming and visiting me. It was a trip. Dude was afraid. Your uncle's on the phone. He don't know I'm here. What the, hello? Stay there. Don't, don't move. 
He came in, he's like, man, I'm getting you high, man. That's messed up, man. You're the one that told him I'm from D.C. area. People called me D.C. because I got Drama City on my stomach, which doesn't represent D.C. It represents Dale City, Virginia, right outside Washington, D.C. It was a trip, man. Then the evil came in real quick with that meth, and I bounced. I got out. I got out of Tucson quick, went back to Baltimore. My homie picked me up. I went back to VA, and that's when, like, I was just homeless. My parents wouldn't take me back in. And I was sleeping under girls' porches carrying band equipment for the, the local band in my gang, just staying up, drinking, smoking weed. Got a bunch of head injuries, and that affects a lot in my life That now that I became more intellectually stimulated on that. And then I found out that the two girls were pregnant with my kids. One of them wasn't mine. Of course, I showed up to her giving birth, and it wasn't my kid, obviously. <laughs> and then I missed the birth of my daughter. Man. We made it that day, but and then I robbed a jewelry store. 1999, Bone Thugs and Harmony. It's 1999, my player. <laughs> Masked up, went and robbed a jewelry store, man. And uh, they all got caught and I didn't. And this was out there? This in... was in, in, in Lake Ridge, Virginia. Wow. At a place called Tackett's Mill. And I went on the run in Florida. Because I've been to Florida a few times by that point doing crank. Drinking moonshine. All I had was a shotgun, a 20-gauge shotgun and a pit bull named Chino. Just running around sleeping with women. In their 50s, 18 to 50. Just living in the flesh, bro. I was 21, something like that. And then they testified against me. I got locked up in Manassas, Virginia. I turned myself in. And then I got testified against by my own people. And that just fueled my resentments towards life and everything else, plus the head trauma. I had a stroke. I got hit in the head at a, at a club. I got hit in the head with a police smack light. I dent my skull right here. I had a stroke. And that's when I started... Doing cocaine. How right. many how many times up to this point had you been incarcerated? Once. Just once? And then the jewelry store, so twice. Yeah, so the car and then the jewelry store. Man. Not robbing it, breaking into it. It was a heist. It was nighttime. Let's get in quietly. Let's go in there. Nextel had phones that you hit the side button. It was a two-way. You'd be like, beep, beep. Yeah. Oh, snap. Popo. Boop, boop. One time. Boop, boop. That was it. Homegirl was in the car. She's like, boop, boop. Shit, 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 shit. And that was it. And I was like, bye. And I was gone. I went my way. He went his way. He went his way. She was already locked up. I went on the run. My father was going to lose his security clearance at the Pentagon because I am an active gang member. My name, I was on file as a member of this gang. Yeah. So I turned myself in. That was the first time I ever did anything for anybody. Turning yourself in? For my dad. First time I really, truly, I mean, truly, I've done things nice for people, but truly did anything out of myself to benefit that of another human being's life. Being selfless. There you go. And that was my dad. Were you ready to quit at that time when you turned yourself in? Or was it just a temporary no. fix? No. I'm, just a Band-Aid. Yeah, man. I try to get down and get it in. But then I went to a program in there, a life learning program for men. That was a six-month program. How long were you in? Less than a year. Okay. Yeah. Because the jewelry, the, the, the car thing, even though I said I did it, I didn't do it. I mean, I had it. That was my first offense. So lawyer came out, calling me a punk. Get your life together. You don't want to get locked up. Look at you. But it was a bunch of teenagers in Detroit, where my homies from, that were stealing brand new cars off the lot with their key that came out the machine. And they were selling them for cheap, just taking cars off the lot in Detroit. Detroit makes cars, or made cars. That was yeah. that was a spot. So just taking cars, taking cars, taking cars. So got locked up for that. It was it was less than a year, so I was in there. That was a whole trip. That's a that's a heck of a story. And that's when like demonic presence started coming back in my life. Up until that point, they were gone. They were gone until I got locked up, but not locked up because I was locked up in population. And that was a whole story. And I had a lot of G's in there in these different cells. I walked through and they'd be like, "Yo, what up, G?" And I was like, "Okay, this ain't gonna be that bad." You know what I mean? And I was terrified, little dude. Yeah. So while I was in there. For a few months, then I got transferred to a program that people were suggesting that I go to that were locked up and were writing me. And when I went in there, I didn't realize that it was a Christian-based program for men in this mod with a bunch of bunk beds. And I didn't want to go in there once I, I went in there. And that's a really good story in my book. And it's titled Drag Me to Hell. It's because the first night I was in that mod or that pod, whatever you want to call it, I got on that bunk, and that was a fight because I didn't want to go on the top bunk. I fear heights more than I fear death. 
I fear heights more than I fear anything in the car accidents. And it's always been my head that got hurt. But I laid my head down on that top bunk because the CEO was like, do you have no choice? I can't take you back today. Like, sleep it off, and we'll talk about putting you back in general population if you don't want to do this faith-based program. And I believed in God since I was a kid. Just never followed him. Like, how am I going to wear a Jesus piece around my neck and robbing a jewelry store at the same time or breaking into a jewelry store at the same time? How am I going to have thou shalt not kill tatted on my right leg and shoot multiple people? Like, what are you doing, bro? You're wearing a crucifix on your body. And you are destroying people's spirits. Now, I wasn't only a thief and a klepto to materialistic stuff. I was stealing people's everything. Think of it. Their happiness, their goals, their ambitions, their space, their time, their energy. Possibly their lives at certain points. I was a thief to all things. Yeah. But the first night I laid on that top bunk in that, in that program, those spirits came out the walls at me. They came from the ground. They pulled me off that bunk, slammed my head on the concrete. I'm grabbing for dude's feet that are sleeping under me. And I'm screaming, 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 screaming. Nobody's waking up. They're dragging me through. The light was off in the, in the freaking everywhere. And they dragged me through the hallway. And I'm just seeing like the, the emergency lights. And they're fading away into the darkness. And then I boom. And I jumped up. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. And he was just like, come back. Come here. And it explains all that, how that faith that 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 god-fearing man just was like and then he he opened the bible he said they're coming for you everybody else was sleeping or if they weren't they weren't allowed to say my name they were trying to whisper my name oh man what up jay what are you doing it wasn't it was real to me he was like the evil's coming for you what's going on guys i'm so sorry to have to do it to you but we're gonna have to stop this episode right here Thank you guys so much for listening and make sure you tune in next week for part two of this week's episode. Hope you guys have an amazing weekend. Much love. God bless. Peace. What's going on, everybody? This is Buddha from the Rcast, and I just wanted to thank you for checking out this week's episode. It means a lot. And if you could share it with a friend or a loved one, somebody you need in recovery, or maybe somebody who just needs that little bit of extra positivity in their life, we'd greatly appreciate it. If you would like to join us here on the Rcast, either in the studio live or online, hit us up. The links are down in the show notes of this episode. And on there, you can find direct links to our main website here at America's Rehab Campus and all of our social media platforms. Follow us. We keep the posts positive and motivational, focused on recovery, health, and wellness. As you know, in this modern day and age, we need as much love as possible, y'all. And as always, if you or somebody you know is in need of substance abuse treatment, please don't hesitate to give us a call. We're open 24 hours a day, and our direct phone number is 1-833-272-7342. Once again, that phone number is 1-833-272-7342. I hope you all have a beautiful rest of your day. Much love and God bless. Peace.